warning or something. Um, yeah, so uh, I can just start by kind of explaining a little bit more of what I'm working on. Um, so like I mentioned, I'm a freelance journalist currently working on my master's at New York University, and uh, this is my master's thesis, but I'm also um, obviously hoping to get it published as a journalistic article, um, although I don't know where yet. But um, I'm essentially interested in looking at um, these kinds of tours, uh, particularly in Egypt, that are uh, with like an alternative um, history view. So, you know, whatever you consider that to be, I'd love to hear more about it, but um, essentially, you know, differing from what like archeologists or mainstream historians say. Um, and mm -hmm. I just am really interested in hearing about, you know, your personal story, um, how you came to found your tour company. I know you mostly um, focus on South America, but um, you know, that I've seen that you do, you do some tours in Egypt as well. Um, and yeah, just overall your, your philosophy and, um, uh, you know, what those tours are like. So, sure. um, yeah, if you don't mind, if you could start out by telling me kind of, um, a little bit about your personal history and, and how you got into this. Um, okay. Well, I was, I've been fascinated by ancient places since I was very young, um, our bedtime stories from my uh, from my mom were ancient history, like Greece and Rome and Egypt. And so through her, I developed a fascination with ancient Egypt. And of course, having a family subscription to National Geographic, then I got to see what these places looked like. But I had no idea of the complexity of it until I actually went the first time about 10 years ago. And I saw obviously that um, the standard story of archaeology was either hiding or ignoring or not seeing obvious evidence of very advanced technology that would have had to have existed um, before the time of the pharaohs. Mm -hmm. And what, so that was the first time you went to Egypt 10 years ago? Yeah. Okay. And was that just for your own kind of uh, personal interest or was it as part of some kind of organized group? Yeah, I was invited on a tour by um, author Stephen Mailer and uh, engineer Chris, uh, Christopher Dunn. Mm -hmm. And C Christopher Dunn it was the first person to really, um, you know, from an engineering perspective, he was the first person to really show that it was clearly obvious that um, the toolkit of the dynastic people, as in copper chisels and bronze chisels, could not have been responsible for especially sculpting hard stones such as granite, because we see tube drill holes, we see lots of uh, saw marks and things like that that could not have been achieved using the dynastic um, toolkit. Mm -hmm. So seeing that physically in person uh, was just absolutely jaw-dropping because the evidence was so obvious on the first day that I knew that, um, again, that we were being misled either intentionally or unintentionally about the history of ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. And how had you gotten into um, uh, like leading tours in general with, with Hidden Inca tours? Um, was that before that? Uh, yeah, we've been doing that for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And okay. it was just, that, yeah, just that my, my sister-in-law, I went to Machu Picchu with her. She's Peruvian, but she'd never been before. Mm -hmm. And as we were walking around in the, the complex, she said, Brian, you should be a tour guide. And so I thought, well, I guess I could do that. And that's, that's how it started. Okay, cool. And, and what did you do before that? Uh, before that, I was, a, I was living in Canada and I was a sculptor and cabinet maker. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you started Hidden Inca Tours, um, were you also looking at it from that perspective of, you know, there's something more here than what archaeologists say, or was there, or was that philosophy different back then? No, it's exactly the same thing, because I've been working with power tools all of, since I was about 11 years old. So I know what, what uh, power tools can do and what, and what hand tools can do. And again, the Inca, again, was thought to be a Bronze Age culture. So the first day that I was in the city of Cusco, I saw the difference between what the Inca could have done and what would have been technically impossible for them. And that automatically, I saw two completely different styles of construction and thought, 
well, I understand how they could have done this, but there's no way that they did, you know, the other. And that's what sparked my interest. And again, if you look into the um, archaeology and other academic journals, they all insist that everything was done by the Inca, just like the Egyptologists insist that everything was done by the dynastic people. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when you went and, and you know, saw this for yourself, um, could you go a little bit more into like what specific things stood out to you, especially as someone who has this experience working with um, with power tools, as you said? OK, well, the what we see in terms of Inca construction is we see adobe mud bricks. So brick, bricks made made out of adobe. Uh, it's a mix of a, a local clay with dirt and also straw. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of obvious. They, they still use that form of construction today in Peru. But then you also see these, especially walls where the stones can be multi-ton in size. Each one is distinctly of a specific shape and size. Like no, no two stones are the same and they fit together without any mortar or, or cement or anything like that with an astonishing level of precision. And so that, you know, automatically showed me the difference between what, what the Inca were capable of and what they weren't. Mm -hmm. Right. And were there people whose work you were reading at that time about this? Like, were there others who were talking about this? Or was this kind of like you, uh, you know, developed this organically? Uh, no, there was the work of Graham Hancock. Mm -hmm. who wrote finger who wrote fingerprints of the gods so he was he was my best initial reference but uh, again i had no idea of how complex the story was until i until i physically went to cusco and, and saw it in person and then automatically i i knew that history was not um the, the historical picture we're given is not a full picture mm -hmm. and since then i've met, i've met a number of um of geologists and stonemasons from all over the world who have come with me to look at, at this. And they none of them have been able to, to say how it was possible mm -hmm. and e even how some of it would be possible today. It's some of it's beyond our level of technology. Even today. Yeah. Wow. Um, and at that, or at least at any point then over the past 15 years that you've been doing this, have you, um, interacted with archaeologists about this or like, you know, uh, I guess, tried to um, get their explanation for why this is like this? Oh, yeah. For years, I've done that. I've had lots of interactions with Egyptologists and um, archaeologists in Peru, and they simply dodge the questions. Mm -hmm. um, they, they simply say, my ancestors did this but they can't explain how it was done. And that's, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's some Egyptologists that, um, you know, will meet me, but then they'll refuse to interact with me because um, they know that what I'm saying is something that they can't sim simply blow off. Mm -hmm. but, but again, they don't want to engage with it and try to refute what I think is obvious evidence. Mm -hmm. So you've never had, you know, for example, an archaeologist or someone who's been able to say, this is how they could have done it with those tools. Well, there, there are some videos on, on YouTube that attempt to do that, mm -hmm. but the inefficiency, the inefficiency of what they're attempting to do is completely ridiculous. So for example, there are some videos that show uh, like a bronze straight saw and then what they do is they say that we're able to cut granite with this. Granite has a lot of quartz crystal in it, which is seven on the hardness scale out of 10, 10 being diamond. Mm -hmm. And so they'll sprinkle some, um, some sand and then add a bit of water and then move the saw back and forth like that. And um, after a full day, they may have penetration of a few millimeters. Mm -hmm. And so at, at that rate, it would take, several years to be able to cut one block so mm -hmm. they have a, they have attempted to do that but it's, it's um it's quite you know it, it's quite silly because the inefficiency is ridiculous also christopher dunn the engineer has been on several television shows and he does a 
uh, a display where he takes a block of granite and a, a hardened bronze chisel, and then he strikes the granite with the chisel and the chisel automatically um, has a, a bend in it or flattens out or, and so uh, that automatic, and it, it makes no impression on the stone whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So the uh, after the Egyptologists heard about this, they said, "Well, the uh, the dynastic people would have a thousand people lined up with uh, tables or benches, uh, resharpening the chisels. But if if the first strike doesn't make an impression on the stone, then that that by itself makes that kind of um, explanation rid ridiculous again. So th they always try to come up with an answer, but the answer is almost always completely illogical." Mm -hmm. Right. And why do you feel like um, they don't seem to be willing to entertain these, uh, you know, the idea that there could be a different explanation? I think they're simply attempting to pro uh, protect their paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as, as they grow older and younger archaeologists um, come on the scene, they're much more open minded to look at the obvious evidence. I mean, that's a for an example, when I go to Machu Picchu now, a number of the local guides will come up to me and say, I've been watching your YouTube videos and they've really opened my eyes as to the complexity of this site. Because mm -hmm. we were taught that the Inca built everything, but now I can see the difference between the megalithic tight fitting construction and the much cruder um, work of the actual Inca people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, so do you think that there, that this is changing or like, I guess, how, how recent is the shift that, that you've been noticing? I, I'd say within the last five years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and, and growing. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and do you see that reflected in the larger, um, I guess, if you would call it such like the alternative history community, like more people, um, you know, kind of being interested in these ideas and, and being open-minded, as you say? Oh yeah, a lot more. Uh, th there are a lot of people who are producing YouTube videos now um, mm -hmm. about these sites that I've been exploring for a long time. And mm -hmm. they have the exact same uh, perspective as, as, as I do. Mm -hmm. So recently in December, a group of people uh, went to Egypt and at least four or five of them now have YouTube channels where they're they're saying the exact same thing that I say. That you know, how is it possible with copper chisels you could do that, or how could you move it this block of stone five hundred miles? How could you cut the stone from the quarry? All that kind of thing. So it's growing. Uh, re I wouldn't say exponentially, but it's growing really rapidly, and that's that's the whole function of what I do. It's not to confront uh, the standard paradigm. It's simply to show this to as wide a, uh, an audience as possible. And I've, I've never had one, one person say, well, I understand how, you know, how the Inca could have done it. Everyone says that's impossible. So therefore we have to look at the alternative that there had to have been a much more advanced civilization before that time that, that were capable of feats of engineering um, that we are attempting to understand today. Mm -hmm. And do you have any kind of specific theories about what that civilization was, um, or is it more just that you know that there has to be something more? Um, well, I guess that, you know, it's, it's a lost, it's probably four, at least four different lost civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, whoever did the work on Easter Island uh, was not the same uh, group that were in Egypt and those who were in Egypt were not the same who were in Peru and Bolivia because the the techniques are very very like they're as complex but very different approach to them so at this point I simply say lost civilizations I don't know if they were this you know quote unquote Atlanteans um, yeah. whoever they were they've they've left no trace except for the the stonework that they've done I am open to the idea that they were not of this planet, you know, not that I broadcast that too heavily, but I, I, I don't have a closed mind insisting that they had to have been human. They, they may have been, but maybe they weren't. And I, I think that's another reason why um, academics don't want to touch the subject because it opens up too many doors 
that can't ever be closed again. Mm -hmm. Right. But now that this is kind of, um, I guess, growing and uh, more people are kind of being interested in the idea, what do you think are some other reasons behind that? Behind what? Behind, uh, you know, more people kind of being interested in this idea and um, the idea is kind of spreading. I mean, you mentioned YouTube, obviously. Do you feel like that's kind of like the driving force or are there other factors? Um, well, it's, yeah, it's YouTube. And also I've written <clears throat> 37 books, so that, that works as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those are the two formats that work, work best for me. Facebook and, and those other social media things, I don't think are... I don't think they're as effective or open as they used to be. There's a lot of censorship going on. Mm -hmm. So, so far, yeah, so far YouTube and, uh, and, and my books are the, the major drivers and the tours, of course, mm -hmm. that I personally conduct as well. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit more about, uh, you know, this social media censorship? Like, have you, have you tried to post things that, you know, have not been allowed or what do you mean by that? Well, I just think, uh, it's a, there's a general trend, especially when it comes to people delving into politics that are being, you know, I, I know a number of people who have been banned <clears throat> from different social media uh, platforms because of their attempts to um, expose inconvenient truths, if you want to put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, as far as I know, I haven't been affected so far. I think my field is, is pretty, uh, it's a pretty narrow niche. Mm -hmm. um, and in general, you either believe, you know, people either believe what I say or, or they have no comment. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's where it seems to be right now. Mm -hmm. Right. So it would, it's not a thing where if you tried to post about this on Facebook or something that that would be censored. No, I haven't been affected. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, so you started this, this tour company um, in 20, uh, 15 years ago, you said, so that would be like what, 2005? Yeah, about that. Okay, cool. And um, I guess, how did that start? And how has it changed since then? I mean, you mentioned how you got the idea, but then what was it like to actually get it started and get people interested? Um, mainly, again, advertising on YouTube and, and Facebook, I guess, mm -hmm. <clears throat> with YouTube being, being the major driving force with that. So, um, you know, since then, I've developed a a very big mailing list. Uh, in general, if somebody comes and visits uh, Peru and Bolivia, because those are the tours we mainly do of, of both countries, mm -hmm. then they have a, an interest in, in going to Egypt after that, that or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and then lesser, yeah, then lesser known places like a lot of stuff in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, Easter Island and, uh, Jordan and Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually, um, st I studied abroad in Jordan in college um, and I haven't been to Baalbek, um, but I would love to go. I've, I've heard it's really beautiful. Um, but um, yeah. So I, I, when you started then, were you also using YouTube and Facebook around like 2005, early 2000s? Yeah. I've been on Facebook for a lot. I, I can't remember oh. when I started it's, it's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and have you seen like a growth in, uh, the number of people who are, who are going on these tours over the past, you know, 15 years? Well, we reached a point about three years ago where it was, it was getting out of control because uh, too many people wanted to come. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we've been scaling back since then, just because of, I don't want to visit these sites too often. Mm -hmm. uh, just because, you know, you can only go to certain places so many times before it starts to get kind of dull. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this whole um, pandemic thing we've been going to, of course, I haven't been much of anywhere for almost a year. Mm -hmm. So that's restricted me. But now, now we have renewed interest for this year, people coming back to Peru and uh, Bolivia. And then I'm going to Egypt in October. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I saw that, um, which is really interesting. And, you know, I um, would love to go and like, uh, see one of those tours. It's just that I have to do my thesis this spring. Um, but if I am still mm -hmm. working on the story in October, then, um, you know, I, I would love to, to see what that's like. Um, 
but so at that peak, like three years ago, um, how many tours were you doing and like with how many people? Well, we were doing three major tours of Peru and Bolivia um, with about 35 to 40 people. Mm -hmm. Each? And then uh, for each one. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then a number of, of private tours, sometimes one person, sometimes two, sometimes six. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and when you, um, you know, go on these tours, um, who are the people who are generally interested in this? Um, and do you know, so you said most of them come to you, like, because they know you specifically and like have uh, been listening to you on YouTube before, or like, how do they find you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, usually from watching my YouTube videos, because mm -hmm. of, of course, I put an advertisement at the end of each one with the, the website, uh, my website, and also what the upcoming tours are. Mm -hmm. So that, that in general has, has been the, um, the catalyst. Mm -hmm. And what, what are they like? I mean, just if you could, you know, describe in general um, who is, is coming on the tours. Is it generally people who have studied archaeology before, been interested in it, or just like, you know, how, how did they get interested in this? Um, well, people who are looking at, at so-called alternative history, a lot have mm -hmm. been fans of Graham Hancock. <clears throat> they tend to be quite intelligent, relatively wealthy, and relatively well-traveled. Mm -hmm. You know, in general, that's how I would, how I, I would describe them, but not, you know, not ex exclusively, but you know, very, they're all very curious people. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, and you mentioned that you had also read Graham Hancock, right? Um, had, had you been um, reading him and been interested in this before you went to Machu Picchu for the first time? Or did that start after you went and like saw the, the constructions yourself? No, I've been following his career for quite a long time. He, you know, he's written some very fabulous books. Probably the best is Fingerprints of the Gods, mm -hmm. where he traveled around the, around the world and looked at these anomalous places and exposed, you know, through good evidence and documentation that um, the picture of history that we've been given is is not complete. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, he he was my my first major influence, but I've had lots and lots since then. The great thing has been taking people again who are engineers and uh, stonemasons and physicists and uh, you know, scientifically minded people in the field to look at the stuff themselves and get their and doctors and and get their reaction to what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. And then, um, I guess, how do you? um get the material for your your books um and like how how does your research process work um in general for books yeah yeah like you know um i I'm, i haven't been able to read them so i'm sorry in advance but um if you could okay. tell me a little bit about like you know uh how you how you research and, and what your writing process is well, basically, basically by going on location and, and taking lots of photographs and observations. <clears throat> and then the book idea will tend to start to nurture itself in the, in the back of my head for, uh, you know, usually some months. And then all of a sudden, I, uh, and then I'll look up a lot of, uh, of the standard information um, on the internet. And, and then all of a sudden, I just I just turn on the computer and, you know, just start going and going and going with uh, with what I what it is I've um, I found out. Mm -hmm. And the photo I use lots of photos because, you know, a picture is worth at least a thousand words. So that's that's why I use lots of photos. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, with the videos, it's the same thing. It's just going on location, filming things that look anomalous. And uh, I, you know, Again, I, I try not to say exactly who made them or exactly when these things were done. I just uh, present the information and let the, you know, let the viewer make up their mind as to whether standard academia covers these subjects properly or not. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. So um, 
do you feel like there would ever be a chance, at least, you know, within our lifetime that we would find out more about, you know, what could have happened or, um, that explains these, these anomalies? Um, or is it just that you think we'll never know? No, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's an evolutionary process. So there's a lot of evidence that there were a series of cataclysms that occurred on the planet between about 12,800 and 11,700 years ago. You see damage to the stone that is cataclysmic. You see, and you see that in Egypt and Peru and Bolivia and uh, Petra in Jordan and Baalbek in Lebanon, where it looks like work suddenly stopped, that none of these places, either these places were never completed or they were completed and then very badly damaged. And so then you look at, so, so there we have the time frame. And there's a lot of um, scientific data that, that backs that idea up, including Dr. Robert Schock of Boston University and hundreds of, of other uh, scientists are looking at this now, mm -hmm. that there was a, a what we call the pre-cataclysmic uh, civilizations who were capable a very advanced uh, stonework and engineering. Then all of a sudden there was a collapse of these civilizations. And then what we call civilization as in the dynastic people, uh, those of the Indus Valley, the ancient Chinese, et cetera, um, that they were like a renaissance of knowledge. They were bringing the knowledge back. They weren't the ones who invented civilization. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you think that we'll know kind of what that ancient pre dynast or uh, sorry, pre-cataclysmic civilization was if more research is um, done? Yeah. Well, the, you know, the more I visit Egypt, the more information I'm, I'm able to, um, to pick up from, uh, in general, just through observation. Uh, the great thing about Egypt is that they're, they're opening up more and more of the ancient sites to visitors. Mm -hmm. So there were places that were there were always off limits. And now if you pay a special fee, you're given access to locations that were impossible to visit before. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, I think I heard about this recently. Like wasn't the um, El Lahun period a pyramid opened only like two years ago or something like that? Yeah, re reopen. That's true. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you actually tell me a little bit more about your visits to Egypt? Um, like, for example, um, since you mostly concentrate on South America, how do the ones in Egypt come together? And like, when do you decide to go there? Well, in general, we've done it once a year, like uh, either in March or April. Mm -hmm. So we've had to cancel the one for this month because... It's just, you know, the world is too unstable at this, uh, at the moment. So we've, we've rescheduled for October, mm -hmm. um, but then starting, starting next year, we'll probably do one in March and then one in October. Okay. And uh, yeah. And is that because there's like more of an interest in Egypt now as well? Yeah. Egypt, you know, Egypt got in, into big trouble with, uh, they had um, a lot of political problems. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had a lot of uh, bombings and things going on. You know, you know, Egypt's gone through, you know, political problems, terrorism problems. Now, this problem, mm -hmm. but uh, Egypt is is one hundred percent opened up now, mm -hmm. and um, and I, again, like I was supposed to leave, I think tomorrow to go to Egypt, but it's just it's it's too difficult at this point to get out of one country into another and then back again. So if we leave it for a few months, then um, I'm sure that things will, and with all the vaccinations going on, et cetera, I, I think that things will get much, much better, much faster than what most people think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm sure the past year has been hard for, for tour you know, companies everywhere um, because of this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I guess, I don't know, do you get a sense that people after kind of being in lockdown for so long are even more interested in going out and seeing some of these things for themselves? Oh yeah, much more. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. A lot yeah, of people, yeah. a, a lot of people have been trapped for a year without being able to go much of anywhere. So that, that feeds a, a, a major demand. Also Egypt is about to open up its new museum, which will be the largest single building museum in the world called the 
the Grand Egyptian Museum. So that, that will create mm -hmm. an incredible uh, tourist draw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had heard about that. That's near the Giza pyramids, right? Yeah, right next door. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, and um, you know, uh, who do you, how do you decide who you're going to go on these tours with? So for example, um, I know that you collaborated with um, some other people who are kind of active in the alternative history space. So do you guys all like talk to each other or like how is there a coordination between people who are working in this, um, in this space? Well, it, it, it kind of goes through phases. So um, through different tours, I've been able to uh, invite, I think all of the major so-called alternative history experts like Graham Hancock and engineer Christopher Dunn and um, geologist Robert Schock and others. So uh, we kind of reached a point where I had invited all of the major ones that I could think of. Um, and so in, in future, I'm inviting people who are younger than me to come along, who, who are not experts yet, but who are um, kind of um, creating the new path for a younger audience to, um, to be excited to go. So there's, there's one, one guy called um, Jimmy who has a a YouTube channel called Bright Insight, and mm -hmm. he's got 1.3 million subscribers, I think. Mm -hmm. And then another guy called Ben of another channel called Uncharted X, and Ben is actually an engineer, so he can, uh, you know, he approaches this subject from, from a very uh, scholarly, um, hands-on perspective. So th those are the people I'm I'm attracting now to uh, collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I actually um, have been following both of them and like uh, watch their videos. So um, I, I find that really interesting that there's kind of like a new generation almost of yeah. people who are using this, this new tech, not really new technology anymore, but you know what I mean? Like um, presenting it in a new format. Um, right. Yeah. So um, uh, kind of in that vein, um, I know, I believe Ben is Australian, right? Um, yeah. And I know there's people who are kind of are around the world on this. Um, do you find that um, there's more people talking about this in the U.S. or like, quote unquote, Western, like English speaking world? Or do you uh, have you heard of alternative historians, as you say, um, in other countries or, uh, you know, speaking other languages? Uh, well, all of the above, but predominantly, I would say people living in the U.S., Mm -hmm. to some degree living in, in Canada, others living in Germany, England, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, and, and Europe. There are some researchers in, uh, in Russia. Actually, there are a lot in Russia mm -hmm. and, um, and other people yeah, who speak different languages. But I, I would say still predominantly American-based people like Ben Ben's Australian, but he lives in California. So. Oh, okay. I didn't know that actually. He's, he's, um, he's an American-based guy. Uh -huh. yeah. Got it. Um, yeah, actually, it's interesting you mentioned Russia because um, I had heard about this other group called the Laboratory of Alternative History in, in Russia. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, how, how, what's your relationship like with them? Uh, and like, how did you hear about them? Oh, it's, it's really good. I think I found them. I think I found them on YouTube or somebody connected with me with them on YouTube and we've been collaborating back and forth. Uh, they saw places in Egypt that took me years to find. So they were, you know, they were very good on the ground being able to, to go to locations that uh, quote unquote were off limits. But in Egypt, the important thing is you're able to bribe almost anybody in Egypt to give you access to places that are are quote unquote um, off limits. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, the Egyptian government is wisely opening up places that before were, were taboo. Uh, one's called the Osiris Shaft. Uh, also recently under the Step Pyramid of Saqqara, uh, I was able to go in March of last year. And there's, there's a huge underground complex there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another site called the Osirion. Mm -hmm. which uh, will be which has just opened up 
And uh, I'm sure there'll be other places too that will be, um, be opened up for us and others to go and explore. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And, and when you say you collaborate with them, do you mean um, on videos or on tour, like potential future tours? No, mainly just uh, them sending me photographs or, or them uploading videos or photographs of places that I may have heard of, but I have never been to. Mm. Um, so that, you know, that's what's great about this is that it's a, it's a never ending thing. As more sites get opened up, uh, the more evidence there is of this lost period of, um, of history that we are exposing to the general population. And that generates even more interest Mm -hmm. And my basic philosophy is that if you can show that um, the history of Egypt is more than 5,000 years old, that should generate much more uh, tourist interest than keeping with the paradigm that 5,000 years or less. The same thing with the Inca, that the Inca uh, end, began about 1,000 years ago and ended about 500 years ago. If you can say, well, there was a much more sophisticated technological civilization there before that. Mm -hmm. then that that does drive more interest in visit people visiting these locations mm -hmm. yeah definitely and and so kind of what is the response from um you know whether it's it's archaeologists in these countries or uh just you know the um people in those countries that you talk to like generally are they receptive to this or um is it similar to kind of the response of like american archaeologists who are more dismissive well no no the local archaeologists are, are very dismissive too mm -hmm. uh so that you know they basically don't want to get into conversation with you mm -hmm. because because they they don't want to open up pandora's box uh you know which is too bad for them local the more local people i meet though the more i'm able to learn about the history from them. And uh, you know, quite a few are much more open-minded about the idea that uh, civilization in these countries is much, much older than what we've been taught. Mm -hmm. uh, that, comes, that comes from the oral tradition of the people themselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, it's getting more and more curious as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you bring that up because I'm sure you've heard this criticism before, but some people say that, for example, um, saying that people like the Incas or the Egyptians couldn't have built these monuments um, could be like a racist idea or basically dismissing the ability uh, that they had. So do you, I guess, find that that's not true or um, how do you kind of respond to that? Or if you have well, that's what, before. Well, yeah, but, but that's why I tread very carefully. I, I simply present the evidence. You know, this is the toolkit. This is the accomplishment. The toolkit can't be used to create the accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people don't bother to debate me because they, they, can't, they don't have a counter argument. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I try very carefully to, to not offend the descendants of the Inca people in Peru about this, um, but more and more of them are catching on that their own history is much more complex and fascinating than, than what they were or were, or were not taught in school. His, history in Peru is not a big thing that is taught uh, in this country, except for the colonial time frame and modern history. They don't delve too much into, into the Inca and older civilizations. I, I don't know why that is, but um, and a lot of Peruvians aren't, aren't interested in history anyway, but those that are, um, you know, are really waking up to um, the, the truth about this um, hidden past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I feel like we, or at least I did in school, learned so much about these civilizations. Like I remember, you know, in middle school having units on the Inca and the Aztecs and the ancient Egyptians. So it's kind of, yeah, interesting that in those countries themselves, people aren't really taught that and it's not like emphasized. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess, what do you hope... Um, people who don't believe this or disagree with you um, take away from it, um, you know, whether they watch your videos or, you know, read about this um, wherever I write or wherever somebody writes about it. Well, again, all, all I do is, all I do is, is show evidence. That's it. You know, I, I don't have an opinion about who did it. 
I do have an opinion about who couldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> that's, that's all I'm, I'm trying to do. Um, my, my goal is to show the, the Peruvian people that their history is much more fascinating than what they've been, have or have not been taught in school. Mm -hmm. um, Egypt is a little more complicated in that um, the descendants of the dynastic people still do exist in Egypt. They're called the Coptic people, mm -hmm. but they're only about, they're about 8% of the population. They're the Coptic Christians. Mm -hmm. So I think also the vast majority of Egyptians probably don't care about their history as well, ex mm -hmm. except from an economic point, in general, from an economic point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, most of the Egyptologists I've met are, are just, they're very close-minded about everything. Um, but that paradigm is collapsing. So it's exposure to younger generations that uh, is the most important thing at this point. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. Um, is there any kind of archeology span or like academic literature that you do read and that you do kind of uh, agree with or, um, you know, see that, it makes sense. Um, just curious if there's anything that you have read that has kind of like impacted you in that way. Well, I have, you know, I've, of course, in order to do this, this study, you have, you have to look at the literature mm -hmm. and you have to look at academic papers. Um, but the academic papers I've seen do not explain how the megalithic work could have been done. Mm -hmm. um, they, they just kind of gloss over that. In one perspective, they would say, well, it, it was the finest craftsman who would be responsible for the finest work. But again, if you have copper and bronze chisels, you can't do the work. So that, that's not a proper argument. Mm -hmm. So I've, in order to, to write my books, I've had to do a, a lot of study of, of academic work. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, again, it's, it's quite obvious what the Inca were capable of doing, what the dynastic people were capable of doing. The, the uh, dynastic people were brilliant at working with soft stone, like limestone and sandstone. Mm -hmm. And bronze chisels, to some degree, would be relatively efficient with those materials. But it doesn't explain working in hard stone like granite or diorite or, or basalt. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's where we find the difference. We find beautiful works of the dynastic Egyptians done uh, in sandstone and, and limestone, especially in southern Egypt. But then when you get to the more northern area, that's where you find the megalithic stuff at the Giza Plateau and other locations like Karnak and mm -hmm. Tanis, which is in the Nile Delta. Mm -hmm. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that I, I have a pretty good kind of picture of, um, you know, the work that you do and, and uh, kind of like your, your worldview, I guess, um, just to clarify, um, you know, would you consider yourself an alternative historian or like, is there a term that you prefer? Um, since I, I'm sure it's a little um, like controversial. Well, less and less as time goes on. Uh, mm -hmm. when, you present, when you present evidence that can't be refuted, you're exposing the world to the real history of the planet. Mm. Um, and as more and more people learn this, the more that it's catching on, the less that the, um, that the older, I think the less following there is of, of the standard paradigm. So that's, you know, that's simply what I and people like Ben and Jimmy and many, many others are, are working on now. And that's why it's great to be collaborating with, with them. I'll be going to Egypt with Jimmy in October. He's going to be on, on our tour in October. Mm -hmm. And uh, the three of us just uh, recorded a podcast that should be up on YouTube within a couple of weeks where we, you know, we just talked for, I think, about an hour and a half about what we have, have been looking at, what we plan to do together in the future. And mm -hmm. I think we're planning on doing a podcast every five weeks because it's a, an almost never ending subject. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go into all sorts of little things. And, uh, and unfortunately, Jimmy hasn't done that much traveling. He, that was his first trip to Egypt in December. Mm -hmm. So his, you know, his mind was completely blown seeing this stuff in real life as compared to looking at other people's videos and pictures. But um, I've invited him to come to Peru and Bolivia and be a co-host on a tour. Mm -hmm. In the future, he's very, uh, he's very fascinated 
uh, by that idea. And I hope to work, I've done quite a bit of work with Ben, so I hope to do more work with Ben. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there will be others that will uh, I'll be exposed to over the, over the coming years that uh, I'll want to work with as well. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. Um, yeah, I'd love to listen to that podcast uh, once it comes out. Um, so then maybe just a couple more details about you. Um, where are you based currently? Uh, the coast of Peru. Oh, so you live in Peru. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and um, did you move there when you started the, the tour company? I think you said your sister-in-law is Peruvian, right? Yeah, well, actually my, my wife is Peruvian too. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I moved here, I think, about 14 years ago. It's just, uh, I was uh, simply drawn to the country. Mm -hmm. And I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. luckily, things have, luckily, things have worked out. It's, it's very easy to, uh, to have, a, you know, an idea of moving to a foreign land and then uh, having the, the, the idea uh, crumble or collapse over the course of not being able to make any money or, or, or that kind of thing. And fortunately, it's worked out very, very well for me. And I have no interest in mm -hmm. living back in the U.S. or, or Canada ever again, because this, this little country is very fascinating. And there's much more that I want to explore here and, and beyond as the as the years go by. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. And where, um, where did you grow up? And like, how did uh, you end up in Canada? Um, if you're from the US? Well, I was born in, in uh, Minnesota. Uh, my father was studying at the Mayo Clinic, but both of my parents were Canadian. So when I was very young, my family moved back to Canada to the West Coast, and uh, I grew up and lived most of my life there, but I also lived in the U.S. on and off because uh, being born in the U.S., that gives me two citizenships, so I took a <coughs> complete advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and yeah, it's only about 15 years. Well, no, actually, I was able to go to, to England when I was 16. And the first megalithic site I ever saw was Stonehenge. And that was, you know, that's something everybody knows about. Mm -hmm. But at that time, there wasn't even a, even a fence around it. So we were able to go right up to the stones themselves. Wow. Um, and then just uh, being able to uh, meet with, uh, you know, some fairly major, actually all the major players in, in the so-called alternate, it's not alternative history anymore. It's, it's the real history, but meeting, meeting all of these different people through conferences and stuff like that, I've, I've been able to, to travel with uh, mm -hmm. all of my all of my heroes, mm -hmm. um, except one called John Anthony West, who unfortunately has died. But he was he was the last one I wanted to meet, but unfortunately that one didn't work out. But everybody else um, of any standing um, in this field, I've been able to either meet or and or travel with and explore with. So that it's been wonderful. Right. Yeah, what was seeing Stonehenge like for the first time? Like, what were you thinking when you saw that? If you remember, I'm sure it was well, it, a while ago. No, I do. It, it, it's just, it's very surreal. The, the bus only took us part way there. So we had to walk and it was late afternoon. And uh, there were no taxis or anything like that. And there was no one there. We we're just, you know, you're, you're on the top of this hill and you start walking down and there you see it in the in the foreground. And, you know, it's just, it's surreal to see something like that um, in real life as compared to seeing it on TV or something. Mm -hmm. And then just being able to walk up close to them like that was an amazing experience. I, I have no idea how we got back to the bed and breakfast where we were staying. Mm -hmm. Must have been late at night by that time. But uh, it was, you know, some seeing these things in real life is always so much more amazing than, um, than pictures or, or videos or, or, or TV. Mm -hmm. So the, the same, same thing with my first trip to Egypt. Again, it's like, you know, you, you think the Great Pyramid is this big, but then uh, we were about 10 miles from Giza driving from the airport. And Stephen Mailer, who I was with, he said, look out the right hand window. And there, there I saw all three pyramids and you see them tower above the landscape. You know, the Great Pyramid is 500 feet tall. Mm -hmm. And to, to see it that big from so far away was absolutely mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, did you have similar reactions when you saw Machu Picchu for the first time, as you said, with your oh, yeah. in law? 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, at first, my first trip there, I wasn't going to go because I thought too many people see it. You know, yeah. it's become too much of a tourist attraction. But near the end of my trip, I did go, and I, I was just in I was in shock at how beautiful and big and complex the site is. So I've, I've been there, I think, eighty seven times now, and wow. uh, every time is every time is a pleasure. Uh huh. And, you know, since you live in Peru, are you able to go to other sites like in your downtime that maybe aren't as heavily um, visited by tourists or that are kind of like off the beaten path? Oh, yeah, I've, I've been to almost everywhere now, but um, yeah. uh, Peru was shut down for quite a long time and mm -hmm. uh, ev everything opened up on March 1st. So now we're able to move around and and visit anything we want to. So and it'll only get better as time goes on. So, um, you know, we, we've been through the worst part of it. Mm -hmm. And so the government just decided the country has, you know, the, the country has to open up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was made of a federal um, demand, basically, that, that the country opens up to um, protect the economy from absolute collapse. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, you know, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, having all this downtime has given me lots of time for reflection and things like that and also planning in order to be able to figure out where I want to go in the future so I'm very I'm very happy that things are, are opening up now and uh, yeah it'll be very good yeah definitely um and where do you plan to go in the future aside from I know you mentioned doing more tours in Egypt um but are there other kind of sites that you're looking at um yeah we're going to Malta in September for the first time Malta's mm -hmm. got a lot of, of megalithic stuff, mysterious elongated skulls. Uh, at some point, I want to go to uh, India because there's a lot of a lot of amazing ancient sites there, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Israel, mm -hmm. which I've never been to, but it, Israel has megalithic stuff that uh, most people don't know about. There are some. There are some stone blocks in a tunnel underneath Temple Mount, or yeah, underneath Temple Mount that are 550 tons. Mm -hmm. And so again, you know, I'm sure when you go there, you say, well, how did they do this? And they'll say, well, you know, it was King David decided to, you know, to whatever. And it's like, no, that doesn't work, you know. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I never try to offend the local, the local experts. I simply ask questions and, and listen. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't bother trying to get into disagreements with them any, anymore. I used to do that a lot, but it's, it's kind of pointless. It's better just to listen to what they have to say and glean from it what it is you can. And um, so, you know, the standard story of what we're seeing is uh, the civilizations that, we, that we've heard about in all of these ancient places, of course, were capable of doing amazing things, but they weren't capable of doing everything. And it's the it's the unexplained and unexplainable that, uh, that has always fascinated me and the people who follow me. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely. That, that's a really good way to put it, I think. Um, yeah, and um, can I ask how old you are? 62. Um, cool. And where in Peru are you based? You said it was on the coast. Is it in like a major city or? No, it's a little town south of Lima. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I think that that answers pretty much everything that I wanted to ask. Um, this has been a really productive conversation, but is there anything that I haven't asked uh, that you think is important for me to know for the article going forward? No, I don't think so. I, I, think, you, I think we've covered a lot. Mm -hmm. um, just wondering if, uh, is it possible for me to get a copy of this in Dropbox? Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you mean of the video or of the article once it uh, gets released, wherever that is? What's that? Sorry, do you mean a copy of the video, like from the Zoom or of the yeah. article? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I just need to like save it once uh, we close the Zoom and then I'll upload it later. Um, if you want to email me your Dropbox um, link, then I can definitely drop it in. Oh, okay, super. Okay, that sounds great. Um, well, thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to me. And if I have further questions um, as I'm you know, going throughout the process, do you mind if I reach out again and uh, just ask some follow-up questions? Sure. 
Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Brian.